So I'm an internist and pediatrician, and what I do is called culinary medicine. Culinary medicine is essentially helping patients who have health problems improve those health problems through what they eat and what they do. Um, so we try to make little things better, sometimes big things better, um, in terms of no medication or less medication. So um, it's something that we do here. Uh, we also look at lifestyle, uh, sleep, exercise, a whole bunch of things that, of course, make up the entire person. So today we're talking about the anti-inflammatory diet. So I think before we talk about that anti-inflammatory diet, we need to understand what inflammation is first. And before I get started, although my, my thing does not want to move forward, I don't know why. All right. So before we get started, I just wanted to do a couple of disclaimers. Um, inflammation is super complex. It is just so many intertwining processes that there is no way I'm going to be able to get into in this lecture. Um, but I will explain some of the compl complicated pathways um, and some of them I will gloss over just for the sake of time, simplicity, and to keep you from falling asleep. So, um, and then lastly, this diet might not be appropriate for some people who may have allergies or intolerances to some of the foods that we're going to talk about. So, what is inflammation? Inflammation is really just the body's response to any offending process. That could be an injury, an allergy, an infection, a foreign body, uh, even malfunctioning cells like early cancer cells and toxins. And it's essential part of our body's normal responses to bad things that happen. It protects us. So when there's an insult, the body sends out immune cells, plasma proteins, and chemical mediators all to kind of stimulate more attention to that area. And it, that attention comes out in more cells, more proteins, and more mediators. So the purpose of the process is basically to stop the offending agent, to stop it in its track and allow the body to start healing. And then we can get back to a healthy state. So when we look at inflammation, there are two types of inflammation. And our first is acute inflammation. And if you have that, you know it's happening. It's painful, it's red, it's hot, it's swollen. Maybe you cut yourself or, and get an infection. You know that's there, you're gonna seek treatment for it. But when we have chronic inflammation, it's really below our radar. It's happening below our pain threshold. It's happening for long periods of time. And so it can go unchecked for many years and we don't necessarily know that it's happening, but it's progressing as time goes on. Um, and just over to the left-hand side um, or the right side for you guys, those are some major players in terms of the cells that are participating in that immune response. And I just listed them there because I'm gonna talk about a couple of those cells in a little bit. This is another informative page about the markers of inflammation in our body. You might recognize a couple of these, our C-reactive protein and our sedimentation rate. Those are things that can be uh, checked by your doctor if you're being evaluated for certain health problems, or they could be used to track certain health problems. The other ones are not usually checked on a regular basis, but they are stepping stones to all of those inflammatory pathways. And I highlighted um, the interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, nuclear factor kappa beta, which is the big star of the show when we're talking about a lot of the inflammatory processes, and cyclooxygenases. Those are going to be ones that we'll talk about a little bit more in a few slides. So why do we want to stop inflammation? And, and the truth of the matter is we don't want to stop all inflammation. Um, as I said, it is a normal process that we need to have going on. That's how we heal things. That's how we create immunity to certain infections. So we don't want to stop that. But we do want to stop the chronic inflammation, the low level inflammation that's going on under our radar. Because what ends up happening is when we have that chronic inflammation, it's like, we're constantly calling on these cells, these chemicals, these chemical mediators, and it snowballs. And when that snowballs, more of those things get called to the area, whether that be a coronary artery or you know, something else, and that's where our medical problems start to increase. 
So in fact, inflammation is a major, major player in seven out of the 10 um, of our major causes of death in the United States as of 2020. Um, heart disease, cancer, COVID-19. COVID-19 in particular, the reason why people do so poorly is because of that inflammatory response to that infection. Also lower respiratory tract diseases like COPD or emphysema and asthma, stroke, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. And there are a lot of lifestyle factors that contribute to influencing that inflammation, uh, like taking in too much alcohol, chronic stress, and not being able to relieve that stress, uh, too much or too little exercise. And, and let's be clear, when I say too much exercise, I mean exercising at your maximum capacity for too long, too frequently, and not allowing yourself any rest, which, which is important. We should always understand that. Uh, rest is a part of our health as well. Um, of course, exposure to cigarette smoke, pollution, toxins. And then lastly, uh, the standard American diet, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, and having a BMI of over 30. So let's talk a little bit more about our BMI. Uh, oh, again, it's not letting me do this. Okay, so our BMI is a body mass index. It's a calculation of our height to our weight. And uh, we use it to categorize patients into healthy, overweight, or obese weight range. Um, so you can see our numbers here. So we use this measurement kind of um, as a, a way to measure statistics. And that's how we track and trend weight and health trends in our country. So um, since this is a lecture about the anti-inflammatory diet, we're gonna talk a little bit about what in our society and our diet is leading to this. So obesity has become one of the most common problems in the US today. If we look at the year 1985, which doesn't seem like that long ago to me, but um, less than 14% of our population was uh, over the BMI of 30, which was the BMI for obesity. But in the year 2000, we were at about 30%. And in 2018, we were over 42%, which is just huge. And obesity in and of itself has been shown to be an inflammatory uh, state. But the diet that we follow that contributes to this weight gain over the years is part of the problem. So this is our standard American diet. And, and maybe it's not this bad, but, but a lot of times it is kind of this bad. Um, so there's a lot of meat, there's a lot of sugars, there's a lot of salt and um, processed and refined uh, carbs. So. It's, it looks very yummy when I showed it to my husband, but it's not good. <laughs> so the standard American diet is very high in animal fats. And the animal fats that we're worried about are saturated fats and omega-6 fatty acids. It's also very high in simple carbohydrates or sugars. Basically, we're talking about the refined carbs like uh, white bread, white pasta, white rice, white potatoes without the skin, um, sugary drinks, and things like that. It's also high in processed foods and preservatives. A lot of the processed foods and preservatives are high in salt or sugar or other types of chemicals. So high in salt and very low in fiber because again, they, there's a lot of processed foods in there and it's very low in plant-based foods. As you can see, those pictures really didn't have any green in them except for the green donut. <laughs> mm. So the health problems that we know are associated with the American diet are increased risk for high blood pressure, high cholesterol and heart attacks, uh, obesity, of course, type two diabetes, cancers, and dementia. So how exactly can our food cause inflammation? It's just food, right? <laughs> um, and there's actually quite a few ways, but the ones that we're gonna focus on today are these. Um, so we're just going to start with omega-6 fatty acids. And omega-6 fatty acids are a little bit confusing because we actually need them. <laughs> so it's, it, it is important to remember that they are part of a healthy diet as well. So as I mentioned before, the standard American diet is high in omega-6 fatty acids and saturated fats. 
Omega-6 fatty acids are essential. So our body doesn't make them. So we have to take them in, in our food. And, and there is a certain amount of omega-6 fatty acids that we need to fulfill a lot of the pathways and processes in our body. But when we take in too many omega-6 fatty acids, it, it almost overwhelms the system. And it's kind of like that waterfall over there on the left, like it's just falling where the other one is a little bit more manageable. Our ideal ratio would be four to one. So omega sixes to omega threes, four times to one or less. Um, and then those higher ratios end up, you know, causing a little bit more problems. So as I move on to the next slide, you can see that omega six fatty acids tend to run down this side of the pathway. Um, so it's red meat, corn oils, corn, eggs, um, safflower oil, sunflower oil, all of those tend to be shunted down this uh, left hand side where there are more pro inflammatory uh, molecules. And the omega threes are a little bit more on the other side. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So that was our omega-6 fatty acids. And the next thing we're going to talk about is advanced glycation end products. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes, and it's also very complex. So I'm, I'm going to try and, and make it uh, interesting. But it's also um, one of the most common ways that we can harm our body with our foods. So advanced glycation end products, or AGEs, are proteins that are modified um, and fats that are modified when they are bonded to a sugar. And um, that process can actually occur in our body or it can happen in our cooking process. So when you take a food like a, a meat, maybe a red meat more likely, but also cheeses, uh, eggs, butter, mayonnaise, uh, margarine, oils and nuts, and then you cook them and you brown them. It's called the Maillard reaction. Um, the sauteing, that frying, that toasting, all of that browning uh, leads to a reaction that forms AGEs. And the AGEs are actually no good. And normally our body has a way of taking care of those AGEs, but when we take in too many of them, either through our foods or it, it's occurring in our body because we have pre-diabetes or diabetes and we have lots of sugar kind of free floating around and it's able to bond with those AGEs, then um, it will produce something called a reactive oxygen species, which is very weird noise. Um, it is a reactive oxygen species, which is a, ra uh, a free radical that contains an oxygen and it's a harmful chemical. So this increases NF kappa B, which was one of those inflammatory markers we spoke about uh, before. And it will call for more of those chemicals, more of those molecules, and more of the cells that we had seen earlier to try and take care of it. Our macrophages come in. Our macrophages are cells that are like Pac-Man. They eat bad things like bacteria, but they also will eat abnormal damaged cells that have been damaged because of um, inflammation. And so those macrophages come in and they try and heal things but they're not able to do the whole job. So it also becomes a very uh, vicious cycle. And those abnormal cells that have not been healed will start to contribute to things like diabetic complications, vascular disease, just plain old aging and degenerative disorders. So I know that was a lot. So I'm just gonna try and show it a little bit more in detail. Um, and I'm not gonna use a, a lot of, um, fancy words, but um, so you have these menacing AGEs, they look very bad right there, and they will bind to their uh, receptor called the RAGE, the receptor for AGEs, and we have lots of RAGEs on our inner lining of our blood vessels and on the outer lining of our blood vessels and also on our platelets, and the platelets are the cells that are responsible for blood clotting in our body. So when those AGEs bind with those uh, RAGEs, it actually causes a thickening of the blood vessel. And when it causes thickening of the blood vessel, it not only makes it thicker, but it actually makes it more porous. So it's kind of like you're trying to build a house with really, really thick concrete blocks, but then you leave holes in the middle of it. Um, so it really decreases the integrity of the house you're trying to build. So now we have 
these really thick concrete blocks, but lots of holes in them, and the holes actually cause more inflammation. So we move on to see what the platelets do. Those platelets also have those rages, those receptors for AGEs, and it makes platelets want to be sticky. So those platelets will be sticky, so they want to stick to themselves. They want to stick to holes in the blood vessels, and then that will be the beginning of a coronary artery plaque or a blockage in your artery. So let's see here. A similar thing kind of happens when we talk about cognitive decline in AGEs. Cognitive decline is, is essentially just the forgetfulness that we have as we get older, or it could be um, the, uh, the abnormal process of dementia that we develop with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and cerebrovascular dementia. Cerebrovascular dementia is actually the type of dementia that we develop when we have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, or a combination of those things. And um, it, it acts very much like the other types of dementia as well. So when it comes to those AGEs and cognitive decline, some studies have shown that patients who have more AGEs in their circulation, they'll actually have faster cognitive decline. And, um, on top of that, we have actually patients who have Alzheimer's disease in particular, they actually have more rage in their brain cells. So that, that receptor is essentially causing more inflammation all the time, but it can also do something even more worrisome. It can bring in more beta amyloid, which is the protein that is causing the malfunction of the brain cells in patients who have uh, Alzheimer's disease, it actually can bring more beta amyloid into the brain. So you have more AGEs, you have more receptors creating more inflammation, and then you have more receptors that are bringing in more of that abnormal protein into the brain of patients who have Alzheimer's disease. And you see that there's NF-kappa beta in there again. It's an, a no good player. And again, it creates that, that vicious cycle. Okay, so we talked about our omega-3s, our AGEs, and now we're gonna talk about free radicals. Uh, free radicals are really what I was talking about when I said reactive oxygen species. Um, and we just get a little picture of what happens when we have free radicals around. So we normally have free radicals. It is normal for us to get free radicals um, when we turn food into energy, when we exercise, or when we're exposed to bad things like pollution or sunlight or radiation or something. And free radicals and reactive oxygen, oxygen species are unstable molecules. They have an extra electron that is unpaired and that extra electron wants to bind with everything it finds. So it basically steals electrons from other molecules. And when it does that, it causes damage. And that damage is oxidative stress. When it causes that oxidative stress, it can cause so much damage to the cell that now the cell becomes malfunctional. It's not only ugly and puny, but it also does not work so well. And guess what? That calls on more inflammatory markers. So, um, so we definitely don't like reactive oxygen species or free radicals because they're, they're basically causing damage to everything they come in contact with because they're stealing all those electrons. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, cardiac and vascular disease, and cancers are related to this type of abnormality. Okay, so then toxic exposures. And this is another complicated one, I'm sorry. So toxic exposures, we're going to start with red meat as an example. And most of us don't think of red meat as a toxin. Um, but red meat, like beef, goat, lamb, things like that, they all contain something called heme iron. And heme iron is what makes red meat red. Uh, chicken really doesn't have a lot of heme iron, so it's more of a white meat. So um, dietary heme is absorbed mostly in our small intestines. Um, and then there are proteins that will scavenge what is broken down from that heme. It's broken down into iron and a couple of other things. But when we eat too much of it, we can't have ferritin scavenging all that iron. So iron will accumulate in the large intestine 
and that iron will then cause damage to those cells and increase our risk for different types of GI cancers. Um, now, when we talk about processed meats, processed meats can cause inflammation and, and bad things in different uh, mechanisms. So it also has to do with heme, but it also has to do with nitrates. So when you go to the grocery store and you look at the cold cuts in the, in the freezer section or the refrigerator section, that's why you're going to see those packages that say nitrate freeze, because nitrate is one of those um, uh, compounds that we want to be wary of. So when we eat processed meats, uh, like smoked, cured, salted meats like bacon, uh, salami, bologna, pepperoni, um, or even just those plain cold cuts, when it comes in contact with our gastric acid, which is just the juices that break down things in our stomach, um, it will create a couple of different molecules. One of them is called MDA, and the other one is 4-HNE. MDA is actually toxic in and of itself, and it will cause mutations of DNA that will allow those cells to continue to grow when we don't want them to. 4-HNE actually causes cell death, but it only causes cell death in normal cells. So those other cells that have already been mutated by the MDA, they're not affected by that cell death. So it allows them to grow freely, and that is what increases our risk for colon polyps. Now, when we talk about those nitrates, um, the nitrates also, when they are combined with other things, they become N nitroso compounds. Um, so we don't want those, so you do want to buy the nitrate free ones. And then lastly, heme can cause a change in the way our gut bacteria um, absorb things. It can affect their health. So that will bring us to the last thing we're going to talk about, and that is dysbiosis. So, so polyps are basically cells that are able to grow unchecked. And if you have, let's say we're talking about these types of stimulants, um, the MDA, it changes those DNA cells so that the cells will continue to grow. But the 4-HNE is not effective in killing those cells. So they are able to grow unchecked, essentially. Okay, so dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is essentially an imbalance in the types of bacteria that we have in our gut. Um, and our microbiome is huge. It, it has a huge influence on our health. It's about 40 trillion organisms, and it accounts for about four pounds of our body weight. Um, and usually it consists of about a thousand different species of bacteria with 90% of it um, consisting of two different types of bacteria. And I'm not going to try and pronounce them today. So <laughs> I know my tongue is not going to do it. And the remainder is split into about three or four different families. And when we have dysbiosis, that basically means that we either have a loss of the beneficial organi organisms that normally live there, or we have a growth of possibly harmful organisms, or there's a reduced um, diversity of organisms. So in other words, instead of having a thousand different species, maybe we only have 200, or it could be a combination of all of those things. And here are, are a list of health problems that are associated with dysbiosis. And some of them you would think, yeah, I can understand that. Inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. But when we move down here, and we talk about, ooh, I'm not able to point, but we're thinking about glucose intolerance, which is prediabetes and psychological disorders, you wouldn't think that the microbiome can have such an effect. But there is a profound brain-gut link that can, um, that can be seen. So this next slide is basically looking at irritable bowel syndrome as a specific example. Um, it shows the inflammation that occurs in patients who have irritable bowel syndrome um, when they are eating certain things that we shouldn't. So it will reduce some types of species and it will increase other species that are less uh, beneficial. And that basically can lead to a lot of symptomatic uh, um, patients being symptomatic. So, you know, bloating, uh, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, things like that. But there's stuff going on under the surface, like decreased uh, 
thickness of the lining of the intestine, which ends up meaning that we're not able to absorb the nutrients that we should um, when we digest our foods. Um, it also increases permeability. So remember those concrete blocks with the holes in them. And it can increase low level intestinal inflammation, which will then lead to other health problems. All right, so we talked so about all of those things that cause inflammation. So now what is an anti-inflammatory diet trying to do with all of these things? So an anti-inflammatory diet attempts to reduce a lot of these things by number one, just decreasing your intake of a lot of the foods that we just talked about being harmful. So um, not a lot of red meat, in other words, um, but it also tries to add in a lot of nutrients that will help to reduce the body's uh, inflammatory response, okay? So foods that reduce inflammation, are generally going to have more fiber. If we remember that the standard American diet didn't have a lot of it, there's gonna be more omega-3 fatty acids. Again, we didn't have a lot of that in our standard American diet. Antioxidants, vitamins, polyphenols, and it is a lower calorie diet. It tends to not be super high in calories. Oops, sorry, sorry. Ah. Um, okay, so uh, fruits and vegetables are, Pretty, pretty high in almost all of these. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the antioxidants and polyphenols in a little bit more detail, but first we're gonna talk about fiber. And because it really doesn't make a ton of sense that fiber would decrease inflammation, but fiber decreases inflammation by helping us to control our weight. It helps us to control our weight by making us feel full. So if we feel full, we don't eat as much. And if we don't eat as much, we're going to be a healthier weight. And being at a healthier weight does decrease the risk of inflammation in and of itself that would have been associated with obesity. Also, of course, we have that fiber affecting our microbiome. So we have soluble and insoluble fiber that will affect our bowel health in terms of bowel transit, but also it will feed our good bacteria. So we want them to have the healthy foods that they need so that we can be healthy. All right, so let's move on to those antioxidants. So antioxidants. We hear a lot about them in our supplements, in our skincare, in our foods. There's always a superfood that is a new, brand new antioxidant that you need to buy at the grocery store. But at the end of the day, an antioxidant is basically just something that donates its electron to that free radical. That free radical that was looking for something to bond with, it donates it. So it's basically um, helping to neutralize things so that it's not causing that damage that we saw before in that slide. It's gonna remove all of those yucky guys causing um, the oxidative stress. So um, all of those electrons being donated come from things like this, vitamin C, vitamin E, copper, zinc, selenium, polyphenols, which are basically just a type of antioxidants. And then we have beta carotene, lycopene, lutein, and zeaxanthin, which are pigments that we find in some of those really colorful fruits and vegetables like papaya and watermelon and things like that. So a polyphenol, what is a polyphenol? Um, it is a particular type of antioxidant it can be found mostly in plants, but in some vegetables. And it contains something called a phenol group, which that's what a phenol group looks like. And we don't really know exactly how polyphenols work, but we do know that they, they donate that electron to those free radicals and they can reduce that re the reactive stress and uh, reactive oxygen species. So different polyphenols can do different things. So one type of polyphenol can reduce the production of NF-kappa-beta, and another can decrease histamine release. And histamine is the chemical that's released in your body when you're having an allergic reaction. So that thing that makes you break out in hives or makes you itchy or get a runny nose when it's the season, that's histamine that causes that. Um, others will block receptors that would otherwise accept an inflammatory marker. So in other words, it runs defense for you. It you know, gets into that receptor so that you will not bind with something less favorable. 
And we know that polyphenols can increase vessel relaxation. So, you know, you don't have as stiff of a vessel, so it can lower your blood pressure. It can lower your risk for stroke and it can lower your risk for metabolic syndrome, which is essentially a state of health that is a combination of having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, uh, high sugars, and having a, a larger abdominal circumference. When you put all those things together, it actually increases cardiovascular risk synergistically. Um, so it can reduce the risk of all of those things. And here are the types of polyphenols that we have. I actually did not list all of the polyphenols because there's a ton of them, um, but actually there's a lot of overlap between many of these uh, polyphenols. And I just wanted to bring your attention while you guys are reading the, the different types of foods that are included as polyphenols, but bring your attention to this rainbow here. Um, <clears throat> and these colors represent the colors of the polyphenol themselves. Excuse me, I'm sorry, hold on. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to increase the amount of polyphenols in your diet on a daily basis, a good way to do that is to just think about eating the rainbow and trying to get one or two servings of each one of these rainbow sort of things in your diet per day. Um, and you will be eating many more polyphenols than you might normally if you try to eat the rainbow. So here are some foods that are very high in antioxidants and polyphenols. Uh, again, just notice the, the vivid colors that you're noticing in these types of foods. Beets, raspberries, red cabbage, we're getting all of those deep reds and purples. Um, and then of course our greens, like the, the spinach, kale, uh, all of those deep dark greens are very, very high in all of these vitamins um, and minerals. Okay, so we talked about our fiber, our antioxidants and our polyphenols. So now we're gonna move on to the omega-3 fatty acids. And like I mentioned before, the omega-3 fatty acids are also essential. We need them. We need to get them from our food because our body cannot make them. Um, and omega-3 fatty acids can come from plant or animal sources, but mostly they come from things like flaxseed or fishes. Um, and if you remember this little cascade that we were looking at before, um, those omega-3 fatty acids tend to be shunted down more that less inflammatory uh, pathway. Um, and if you notice, um, well, it actually doesn't mark it here, but omega-3 fatty acids inhibit that enzyme called cyclooxygenase. And when it does that, Cyclooxygenase actually is one of the stepping stones to producing prostaglandins, which are the hormone that cause pain in our body, menstrual cramping, um, a, a lot of other inflammatory things. Um, and that's actually the step where you take an aspirin or an ibuprofen. That's the step that's being blocked when you take those types of medications. So when you take omega-3 fatty acids, it acts kind of like an aspirin in terms of blocking that enzyme so that these things can't occur. All right, so our omega-3 fatty acids, again, they're essential. They come from seafoods, plant foods, lots of nuts and seeds, although many of our nuts and seeds also have omega-6s. And it's important to remember that not any one food is gonna be 100% omega-3 or 100% omega-6. There's always a combination of those types of fats. So here's a list of all of the different seafoods that we can get our omega-3s from. Um, cod liver oil in particular, uh, uh, sardines, anchovies, these are easy to get. They're not too expensive. They are kind of salty, so definitely you wanna rinse those things. Um, but also we can get them from plant-based foods as well, like flaxseed, chia seed, soybeans, edamame, hemp seeds. We have a ton of different sources. So could we get omega-3 fatty acids from land animals? Yes, we can, but they tend to be less plentiful. And when we look at our ratios, remember that ratio that we needed of omega-6 to omega-3 being four to one, if we look at beef, like your conventional beef that you're gonna buy at Publix, um, that ratio is gonna be nine to one of omega-6s to omega-3s. If you do grass-fed beef, it's two to one. So it definitely is better, but you still have to remember those end glycation products or those advanced glycation end products. When we look at poultry, and 
for some reason, chicken has gotten famous for being so much better than meat. But if you look at their omega-3 fatty acid uh, content to their omega-6, the ratio is 15 to one if it's white meat and 17 to one if it's dark meat, as opposed to fish, where it's one to one. And all of your leafy greens are one to one or one to one and a half. So it's actually reversing that, that um, ratio. And then there's eggs. And there's a lot of different designations for eggs, the cage free, um, you know, free range. And really, when you look at eggs, there isn't a ton of difference between all of the conventionally grown uh, cage free or free range. But if you do uh, get, let's say, farm raised or pasture raised chicken, so best bet is the farmer's market. Um, you actually can find that they are three times as high in omega-3 fatty acids than the conventionally raised types of, of eggs. So if, oh, okay. Uh, so if omega-3 fatty acids are so good, does that mean we should be getting them from supplements? Um, and actually most of the studies that look at that um, say that really the, it's, pretty debatable when we get them from supplements. We really, if we like fish, we should eat the fish. I mean, if, if you don't like the fish, okay. But um, the studies show that the benefits in cardiovascular disease and other benefits, they really come from the omega-3 fatty acid coming from your diet, not from the supplement. When we talk about things like Lovaza or Vasipa, which are medications that are used to decrease your, um, your triglycerides and decrease uh, your lipids in patients who have high cholesterol and hyperlipidemia, of course, those do have strong benefit that has been shown through, their, through studies. But when we look at um, the, the supplement industry, there's no regulation of those supplements. So, so you do have to worry about whether or not you're getting the amount of EPA and DHA that they say is in there. And you also have to worry about whether or not there could be contamination. Um, and there are ways that you can try and pick your supplements a little bit um, smarter. And that will be part of the subject that we'll talk about next time in our Lunch and Learn. So, Okay, now we've gotten through all of those and we're gonna to get to our vitamins and our low calorie requirements. So if we think about higher weight, high, people who have higher weight have more fat cells and the size of their fat cells are bigger. Um, so that means that when we have a fat cell that has too many macronutrients or too many calories or too much food in general, that actually increases their ability to produce in inflammatory markers and mediators. So the more fat cells you have, the more inflammatory mediators you have. And if you have more inflammatory mediators, it increases the, the amount of health problems that you're at risk for. So when we're talking about our non-starchy vegetables, our fruits, our whole grains, our legumes, they're all high in antioxidants, minerals, and vitamins, but they're also very low in calories. But if you want a type of food that checks off all the boxes, and is basically, you know, going to do all of that in one food, we're talking about our cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables are super high in pretty much everything that we've talked about today in terms of anti-inflammatory effect. They're high in vitamin A, K, and E, vitamin C, and folate. They have, well, depending on what type of cruciferous vegetable you've chosen, let's say like red carrot, uh, cabbage or you know your little orange cauliflower over there they're very high in beta carotene they're high in lycopene and zeaxanthin and those are really key elements in the treatment of macular degeneration actually patients who have macular degeneration we don't have a lot of treatments for them but the mainstay of treatment is cruciferous vegetables so they are also very high in sulforaphane which is helpful in preventing prostate and colon cancer but it's also a contributor to the not so pleasant smell you get when you're making <laughs> cauliflower and broccoli in your lunch room at work. So we also have all of these minerals. We have lots of soluble and insoluble fiber, and they are also low calorie. So they check every single box. And so here's a lot of our cruciferous vegetable 
sources like radish and wasabi and horseradish. I like spicy things. So <laughs> I, I just like to point those out because they really do bring a lot of more flavor to the foods that you're eating and adding the cruciferous vegetable too. Um, arugula too. I love the spice of that. Um, and we just have so many different options when we're looking at cruciferous vegetables. And lastly, um, these foods don't have to be fresh. Uh, you can get frozen cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and spinach. Um, and it makes it so much easier to have a lot of these healthy foods in your refrigerator at all times, not having to worry about whether it's going to go bad or it's going to get, you know, yucky. Um, they're also less expensive when you buy them frozen. Um, and they're just as nutritious. You really don't lose any of the nutrition by buying them frozen. Uh, the be added benefit is, is that if you're making something like Brussels sprouts, if you do it frozen, it actually decreases cook time and makes it a little bit nicer in terms of, um, you know, how easily you can, you can prepare. Frozen doesn't have preservatives. When we talk about canned goods, it's a little bit different. But frozen, for the most part, if you're not getting seasoned or mixed vegetables, if you're just getting like a pack of frozen broccoli, it's just frozen. There's no preservative in there. So um, gluten and dairy uh, are sometimes popularly excluded from the anti-inflammatory diet, but actually are not super official. It's, it's more so for certain types of patients. Um, gluten, of course, is inflammatory for patients who have celiac disease. Celiac disease is the actual allergy to the protein in wheat, but that is only 1% of the population. Now, there are a lot of people who have uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, non-celiac wheat sensitivity, and wheat allergy, and of course, those people are going to benefit from avoiding gluten. Even patients who have irritable bowel syndrome can benefit from avoiding gluten. Um, and sometimes when we're doing elimination diets, let's say we have a patient who has a problem that we're not quite sure what we, um, where it's coming from, we can do temporary elimination of gluten to see if it improves their symptoms. But there really is very little evidence to suggest that every single patient needs to avoid gluten in order to reduce inflammation. Um, yes, we do need to avoid processed wheats. So like our white breads, our white pastas, things like that. But it's not necessarily because of the gluten itself. It's a combination of those factors. And if, if you recall, um, when we were looking at our omega-3 fatty acids and our flavonoids, whole grains are actually a source of those omega-3 fatty acids and flavonoids. So we don't always want to um, avoid gluten altogether. Then when it comes to dairy, dairy has also been popularly excluded from the anti-inflammatory diet. And there are studies that show that it can worsen certain things like acne. If you do a lot of full fat acne, it can be very contributory to that. Full fat dairy can also, or has been linked somewhat to some certain cancers. However, Yogurt has also been shown to be cardiovascularly beneficial. So the, the jury isn't out yet. Certainly, we need a lot more evidence to figure out where dairy falls in our diet, and particularly for us as a patient. Um, definitely, we don't want to be doing a ton of dairy uh, just because of its fat content, but not necessarily uh, everyone should always avoid dairy 100% of the time. So when we put it all together, the anti-inflammatory diet is a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables, plants, seafood-based proteins, cruciferous vegetables, whole grains, some, um, I don't know if you guys saw it under the flavonoid uh, slide, but coffees and teas, not with milk, not with sugar, just plain old coffee and tea, and beans. And, and really, when you break it down, that looks suspiciously like the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> So let's take it one step further and compare what we got on our anti-inflammatory diet versus our standard American diet. So of course, it's much lower in carbs, it's higher in protein, and it's lower in fat. Of course, we saw that it was lower in calorie, it's higher in those omega-3 fatty acids, it's higher in whole foods versus those processed foods. Um, it has a lot of those 
uh, phytochemicals, vitamins, fiber, antioxidants, and it's higher in those complex carbohydrates and higher in plant fats than the animal fats we see in our standard American diet. And then, of course, there are non-dietary influencers of inflammation in our body, and it's important for us to you know, make time for these things. Meditation is huge for reducing stress. Um, and really learning how to do it is readily available. Um, exercise is a stress on your body, but a little bit of stress is good. And it actually reduces a lot of our mental stress. Getting adequate sleep is also a really big uh, influencer of chronic stress in our body and chronic inflammation. And then, of course, stress reduction and learning how to deal with it. <clears throat> so what can we use this diet for? Well, theoretically, we can use this diet for every single one of these health problems. The problem is, is that the anti-inflammatory diet in and of itself has not been studied all that much. Really, the Mediterranean diet is the most studied uh, diet out there. And we have a lot more evidence for the Mediterranean diet than we do the anti-inflammatory diet. And the reason for that is multifold. I mean, people are unpredictable. We don't eat the same things every single day. I might be going to a wedding tomorrow. I might have a special occasion coming up in a, in a week. I'm not going to eat the same way every single day. So, you know, when I was looking up studies for this, <clears throat> for this talk, there were actually a few studies that lost up to a third of their participants because they were not able to comply with their diets. So that makes it much more difficult for us to study these types of diets in the real world. And then, of course, ah, sorry again. Um, of course, the changes that we make in our diet it doesn't happen overnight in terms of our health benefits. So it's not like we can lock up patients in a lab for months to years or have them log their food every single day of their life for years. So that also makes it pretty difficult. Um, and then sometimes the changes that we make in our diet are not just the diet. So let's say I change my diet and I feel better and I want to exercise great, I'm exercising, and now I'm sleeping better. Well, how do we study which part of that caused the benefit? And, you know, maybe it's all of them. Maybe it's none of them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very difficult to study that in the real world. And then lastly, even when we study the Mediterranean diet, which has the most evidence, there's no study that can tell you exactly how much polyphenols you need to put in your body and exactly how many how much benefit you're going to get from that amount. It's just impossible to study because we're all individuals and it's very um, difficult to quantify. So, but we do have a few studies that look at that and we do have one that looks specifically at the anti-inflammatory diet and in obesity in young people. And in that study, those patients who participated, they were able to reduce their weight by about 7%, and it significantly reduced the markers of uh, inflammation in their body, including the CRP, which remember we talked about earlier in the, in the talk, TNF-alpha, and IL-6. It also increased their vitamin D without them having to take a supplement, which is pretty uncommon. And then it decreased their hemoglobin A1C, which is the three month average of sugars that we use to track patients who have prediabetes or diabetes. In breast cancer, we have a study that looked at um, over 3000 women over a course of seven years. And when they were taking higher amounts of EPA and DHA, which are fish-based omega-3 fatty acids, it reduced their risk of recurrence by 25%. And it actually improved their overall mortality over that seven years. So that also is a huge um, finding for this type of diet. But when we talk about the other types of health problems, we really don't have studies that look at the anti-inflammatory diet specifically. So for metabolic syndrome, remember that syndrome, that's the combination of high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and increased abdominal circumference. When they looked at Mediterranean diet, it did decrease markers of urine, uh, urine markers of inflammation. For type 2 diabetes mellitus, this study actually looked at 
the Mediterranean diet, but specifically increasing the amount of flavonoids they had in their diet, which included naringin, hesperitin, and hesperidin. And their uh, plasma IL-6 went down by almost 50%, which is a, a really statistically significant improvement. And then for cardiovascular disease, again, the, the diet that was studied was also Mediterranean. Um, and in this intercath study, they followed over 1,100 patients with coronary artery disease. And they found that a high adherence to the Mediterranean diet correlated with a low syntax score. And a syntax score is actually the way that we can categorize patients who need stents into highly complex um, or lower risk. So uh, a high score means you have complex cardiac disease and that you are more at risk for having um, more like an open heart surgery versus a stent or, or other percutaneous uh, procedure. So high Mediterranean diet and adherence meant that they were more likely to have a low risk score. And then another study looked at patients who had a heart attack and who had to have um, clot busting and stent placement and if they did not follow a Mediterranean diet, they were far less likely to return normal blood flow to the area where they had their heart attack. Okay, so in summary, we know that the inflammatory effects of what we do eat, we, we know that it is very well established. Um, and our anti-inflammatory diet really just attempts to counteract those things by decreasing our red meats, our dairies, our processed foods, all of those things, um, and then adding in all of the vitamins and phytochemicals that can help us to counteract what we do take in. Um, we do need more research specifically looking at anti-inflammatory diet as opposed to the Mediterranean diet, but this takes years. Really, the Mediterranean diet research has been going on for 20 years. Um, but of course, the Mediterranean diet research it gives us a lot of evidence and it gives us a lot of uh, hope for what we can show with the anti-inflammatory diet. So I do have some recipes. Um, this is one thing this, uh, that I like quite a bit. Um, it's uh, shrimp with arugula and quinoa salad, avocado, um, chopped walnuts. This is a meal in and of itself. You don't need to eat it with anything else. It's actually quite filling. If you don't eat shrimp, you can always do it with salmon um, or you can do it with tofu. Uh, it's, it's very easy to kind of pivot to other types of foods. And then um, the marinade, again, you could marinate the shrimp with that or you can marinate whatever other food you're using. Um, then we have an avocado egg salad with citrus green beans. So um, this is basically using, instead of mayonnaise as our wedding agent for egg salad, we're using an avocado, which is gonna give you a lot of those healthy fats. It's gonna give you a lot of fiber. Um, it just makes a simple egg salad into a healthy, more exciting thing to eat. And then those, uh, there are some green beans there that uh, are blanched with almonds and lemon zest. And those are really nice. When you eat them cold, they're a nice, um, instead of doing like carrots or celery with peanut butter, doing those cold, they're kind of like chips. Um, for our dessert lovers, because <laughs> we, we always do like a little bit of something sweet. Um, a chia seed coconut pudding is great. You're using either honey or agave. It's not a lot, um, but you are supplementing with your chia seeds, which are very high in omega-3 fatty acids, um, and you're using a non-dairy milk product. And then lastly, I know that picture isn't great, but these Brussels sprouts are great. <laughs> we just did them the other night and it's a balsamic and beer braised Brussels sprout. And really, um, the frozen Brussels sprouts are better because it does not take as long to cook them. This took 90 minutes with fresh Brussels sprouts. Um, the good thing is, is that you can just leave them on the stove, go work out, do something else, and then they'll be ready for you later. But this is really tangy and sweet um, because it caramelizes the, um, the beer and it's lovely. As you can tell, I really love to eat. <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. First of all, 
thank you very much for this great presentation. So we know that the soil is also depleted. So the vegetable we eat now don't have the same content like the vegetables sure. 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's one issue. Even if you follow all this, it's not as healthy, unfortunately, as it was 50 years ago. No, of course not. But but we kind of don't I, have a lot of choice, <laughs> you know? Again, what do you, you know, next time there's about supplements, but again, they say, even now with COVID deplete the soil, there's not enough magnesium in our food. Mm -hmm. So should we take magnesium or? Yeah, I, I mean, I think magnesium is helpful for a lot of things. Um, and, you know, as opposed to some of the other supplements that we can take and buy, magnesium is not as likely to cause problems if you're supplementing with a reasonable amount. So yes, you can take magnesium. I love magnesium for sleep. I love magnesium for bowel health. I love magnesium for, for lowering blood pressure, although the scientific evidence is kind of mm, on that one. But we do know that magnesium through our diet really does reduce our blood pressure. So, um, so yeah, magnesium is great if you want to take it. I in what form? That depends on the patient. So you can do magnesium oxide. You can do chelated magnesium. There's also magnesium citrate. Magnesium citrate tends to be more for the patients who have bowel issues and they need to be um, making things a little bit more regular. Um, but it really just kind of depends on the patient. Um, you know, it's more individual. Yes. We have two questions from our Zoom audience. Um, and I'm not turning my audio on, so we okay. don't have the echo, so we okay. can repeat it so it gets to the Zoom people. The first okay. one was um, speak a little bit more about cooking methods and should we be browning our food? I'll let you answer that in the office. Oh, so the question is about cooking methods and whether or not we should be browning our food. Um, so uh, we should try and reduce how much we brown our food. Um, obviously my balsamic braised Brussels sprouts, they were browned. Um, I think that it is very difficult for us to say we are never gonna brown anything, um, that we are never gonna do X. I, I think that it's important for us to learn about smoke points and cooking uh, temperatures for a lot of the different oils that we're using, um, but, I would say we're always going to be browning something. I mean, it's it's a cooking method. And even if you were to say, I'm never gonna brown anything at all, it could still be occurring in our body. So it's important to remember that our body is equipped to deal with these processes. It's just a question of how much we're doing it. And the other question was um, related to using olive oil to cook vegetables and would using an air fryer be more beneficial so that you can eliminate the use of the oil? So I don't have a problem with olive oil. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to repeat the, the question. So the question is about olive oil um, and using an air fryer. Um, so olive oil is actually a very beneficial oil. I mean, of course, if we drink olive oil directly from the bottle, that's not gonna be great, but, but when we're cooking and we're cooking at lower temperatures, olive oil is not a problematic thing to do. And remember, um, we didn't talk about it so much in this lecture, but we do need fat. Fat is very essential for feeling full, for the enjoyment that we have in our food. So we don't wanna cut out all fats. An air fryer is great. I mean, it really is just a convention, a, a convection oven. So it, it cooks on high heat from all different sides. So it makes things feel like they're fried, but they're not. Um, so it is a high heat uh, method. So sometimes you may want to use different types of olive or oils that can tolerate higher heats, but I like olive oil. I think we should use it for most of our um, foods. Any other questions? So um, there are coconut oils that are a little bit more tolerant to high cooking uh, temperatures. Um, we have grapeseed oil, um, avocado oil, and it really just kind of depends on what features you're looking for in terms of smoke point, heat tolerance, and all of that. Okay. Any other questions? 
again, I mean, it's pretty much the same organic versus conventional so that's that's a topic all in a, all in a <laughs> yeah and then it's better because sometimes it's just the price difference absolutely and and that's to me what culinary medicine is kind of about um yes organic probably is better the regulation of it is a little iffy. So we don't always know whether organic is going to be, you know, the exact opposite of a conventionally grown or raised vegetable or food. Um, but, but there have been some recent studies that do look at the percentage of pesticides and things like that, and they are lower in organic products. Now, can everybody afford organic foods? No. And, and for us to say that only organic is okay, I would never do that because I really feel like it's most important for people to just eat vegetables, whether it's organic or not. We can, we can rinse our vegetables, we can um, rinse our canned vegetables. There are always ways to make what we can do in terms of what we can buy a little bit healthier. But for for organic to be the end all be all, I don't believe it is. But if you can do organic, then do organic. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yes. Um, is this accessible online for us? I think it will be actually. I'm um, about the recipes. So I record. We recorded it, mm -hmm. and if um, I'll provide my email address and anyone that requests a copy, and then eventually we're hoping it will be up on our website. But I certainly can get you a copy via email. Yeah. And so for the the recipes that were mine. If, <laughs> I may not have written everything down in terms of process. So if you have any questions, you can always route it through through the Marcus Institute. Okay. All right. So we're going to end the Zoom. Okay. And um, for anyone that's here, I put up information about all of our other summer programming, all of which is free. And um, we do have limited, as you can see, our space is not enormous. So if you're interested in Dr. Pastana's lunch and learns, please register for those before they fill up. Um, and then feel free to stick around. I'm not sure how long Dr. Pastana can stay. Um, feel free to either take your food with you or enjoy it here. Um, and we hope that we'll see everyone again soon. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Oh, no. <laughs> I to your next I hope it will be good too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Now all of these will be recorded. It's just a question of when they put them on the website. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. More than I expected. So, so I, like, was it too, was it too scientific? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> it was. It was perfect. It was what I was thinking for. Actually, when it was Gary and I in um, the DMP program at, at okay. Okay. And, um, and I'm, this is what I'm interested in. Going into, and I'm, I don't know if we have time. I know today's busy, but I would love to ask you more questions on how to how to. Go in this direction with, with practice and learning. And stuff. Yeah. Um, so for for me, um, culinary medicine. Let me just get out of here. Let me show. Um, culinary medicine was was being offered through my residency. Um, I had finished many years prior, but all of those alumni things that they send you, I, I was, you know, I um, saw it in a. Um, in a magazine and I was just like this is what I like I, I love to eat I love nutrition but I really just love food <laughs> um so it was really um, very natural to go that way but the Institute of Functional